Welcome back, everybody. It is Business Monday here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I am Josh Fenton. This is the money man, Gary Sass. He knows all and hopefully will tell us some. Uh, knows all. I know. <laughs> uh, Gary Sass, uh, let's see, the big story last week was uh, a uh, agreement between the uh, SEC and Oak Tree Capital, a billion dollar private equity fund from California with offices in New York City. And uh, they, uh, in the agreement, agreed to pay a $100,000 fine and also copped to uh, trying a pay-to-play scheme uh, with the governor of Rhode Island. She ultimately, after about five weeks, returned the check. Uh, but it, it sets off sort of all this belief that uh, the hedge funds and private equity investments uh, were not always in the best interest of Rhode Islanders and, and especially in the retirees. Your thoughts? Well, on the you know, specifics of the deal, it really wasn't a big deal. Um, but it kind of reinforces a narrative. So if you have time to travel around the country, if you have time to go to San Francisco and Beverly Hills and Wall Street, you know, raising money, if you're the general treasurer and you take a hundred million dollars of pension funds and give it to hedge funds, which some of a billion have, dollars, a billion rather, yeah, sorry, a billion dollars, which are you know obviously very politically connected, as we know, yeah. And something like this comes up, it gives your opponents some fire. It's, it's, it reinforces uh, that you you know, you're a high roller in this whole political game. You generally don't want to be listed in an SEC uh, enforcement action as being involved in a pay to play. No, why not? Now, why would you? Yeah, that's that's not that's not a good thing. <laughs> and the other CC I'm familiar with, you do get paid to play. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different investigation for a different time with the uh, NCAA. But uh, uh, you know, it's it's been an interesting way to story today. Governors raised about 1.1 million dollars from New Yorkers, uh, about another 400 thousand dollars from people who live in Connecticut, mostly mostly in that Darien. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Greenwich area of, tied to the financial uh, investment firms. Uh, you know, th those are big numbers in Rhode Island campaign finance. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the governor's staff says, well, they, they appreciate good government and they want to see uh, Gina Raimondo reelected. Well, certainly they appreciate good government because they have no relatives that would have been subject to UHIP programs. <laughs> and none of them are collecting food stamps. They're not on, on Medicaid. Uh, but the question is, um, you know, why are they so interested in good government in Rhode Island? Yeah. Uh, are they interested in the individual? Are they interested in the uh, ambitions of the individual? Or are they interested in good government? I would suggest if that they're really interested in good government, that that million one could have been donated to various nonprofits, to places like Rhode Island Foundation and others, and made an investment in uh, doing some thinking around here to make things better. Yeah, um, it, 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 it sort of reinforces that you know it's virtually every single Wall Street firm had multiple folks donating you know five hundred, a thousand, or multiple thousands of dollars. Um, it, it's, it's out of proportion with what has gone on historically in the state. Maybe sometimes in big election cycles, uh, you know, Jack Reed or, or Sheldon Whitehouse or uh, Claiborne Pell or John Chafee would have significant fundraising activity. Uh, but in this situation, it's, it's just a relentless amount of fundraising. Uh, across really the most powerful interests in the country. And say, you're not trying to buy influence. I have argued for a long time that these people should be contributing more into senatorial campaigns because the Royal and Senate seat is a cheap, a cheap seat relative yeah. to Texas or California or states where you need to spend tens of millions of dollars and the vote of the United States Senate is equal. Yeah. So they, you know, if, if big Wall Street companies are investing to buy influence, they're buying influence by right. getting a United States senator elected, supporting them. Investing in a governor of Rhode Island of a million people is buying what influence? It's yeah. buying something very different than influence to make this place better. Um, let's jump over, uh, uh, leave that world. Uh, Ted Seidel uh, uh, secured a uh, reward from the, uh, one of the federal regulatory agencies for $30 million. He's expected to collect another 40-something million dollars. 
uh, in whistleblower rewards, to, uh, both, both being record rewards for those agencies. He's been a uh, consistent um, uh, critic of the governor's strategies, both as general treasurer and as governor. D d does this whistleblower rewards uh, give him some extra credibility, and does it have an impact? I think results have an impact, you know, more than whistleblower rewards. Uh, they have some interest and some influence, possibly, but the bottom line is, you know, what are the results? And I start to look at the numbers, and the governor talks about, you know, employment growth. And yes, there has been employment growth in the state. Since Gina Raimondo became governor in January of 2015 uh, through May, the latest figures we have, uh, employment in the state's grown by almost 17,000. There's been about a 3.5% increase in, in employment. And then you sit back and say, boy, that's great. And it is good because a lot of times we haven't seen employment growth. Right. But then you compare it to the rest of the country. And our 3.5 uh, compares to 6% growth nationally, uh, compares to about 5.5% uh, growth in, in, in Massachusetts. So when you look at the amount of growth here compared to uh, the country as a whole, compared to Massachusetts, uh, anybody would have had that growth because it's part of the economic cycle. Uh, when you look at unemployment, our unemployment uh, went down from the time uh, Gina became governor, about 6.6 percent .6 to 4.4. Uh, but we're still 37th. There are 36 states that have a lower unemployment rate. Uh, when uh, Gina became governor, I think we were uh, uh, about 38th or 39th. Uh, but a year before, we were much higher. We were about 48th or 49th. So you look at what's happening, and you say, well, are these economic development programs working? Yes, there's been growth, but there's been growth everywhere. And Connecticut's an outlier. There's some places that we've done better. But most places, we're not quite up to the national average, Not certainly anywhere near Massachusetts on growth. And then you begin to say, OK, well, and it's, uh, to be fair, uh, the success and the benefits of any governor's economic development program and not realized right away. You have to keep in mind uh, that the governor's economic development programs weren't enacted to mid-2015. Mm -hmm. The governor came to office in January. The legislature enacted those programs in, in, in January. And so certainly in a two-and-a-half-year period, there's not a lot of time to figure out are the investments we, we're made you know, you know, working. There's been growth because the economy has been better. But you, then you look in the future, and you do some projections, and projections you know, change. That's why they're called forecasts and, and projections. Uh, but when the uh, Revenue Estimating Conference, which is the official uh, bipartisan, not bipartisan, but by uh, government, uh, both House and Senate, forecast of state revenue and, and the economy comes out, uh, you find out that Mike uh, Levy, who is the uh, vice president for IHS Market, which is now uh, macroeconomics, you know, says that we, we sh we're going to look at about 1% and, uh, you know, growth. Right. No, sorry, four tenths of 1%, you know, growth in employment. Uh, employment Somewhat anemic. Yeah, factor. employment's going to grow uh, for the fiscal year, uh, according to those estimates, fiscal year 19, which we started this month through fiscal 23, we're going to grow 6,000 jobs. Well, if that's what we're only going to get, if that's, that forecast is right, and I hope it's wrong, then we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development, and we're just getting what the organic growth uh, you know, would be. And so the record on growth uh, is very, very mixed. Uh, there's been growth. There have been 24, 25 companies that have come here and then expanded. Uh, but at the end of the day, our performance is not equaling national average. And if that's the number one thing that you're working on, if that's right. where you're going to invest your money, if that's where you're going to create a commerce corporation that operates uh, with a great deal of latitude and very little transparency, and at the end of the day, your economist, not, not my economist, not your economist, right. the people that advise the state on economics, the State Revenue Estimating Conference, you know, look at these numbers, which are really dismal. You realize that if that forecast materialized, we would be 48th in job growth over the next five years. Well, the other disturbing number, and you know, the, the, the Commerce Corporation and the governor tried to put his best possible spin on it, was CNBC's number. And you know, CNBC is one of the people that rank the states, but they they've got a little more panache because it's a it's a finance. But you know, you pointed out that infrastructure was weighted so heavily, but I do want to push back on that a little bit. One of the aspects of it. Uh, was other small states performed significantly better? Well, uh, it wasn't just a big state measurement. 
it, or just the South. It, there was distribution throughout the country. It wasn't just those with lax regulatory structures versus tough regulatory structures. You know, Vermont, Delaware, states like that were significantly better well, ranked you know, than Rhode Island. Th th those rankings really don't tell you a whole lot of what's happening. And you know, we just, uh, at Bryant, you know, did a study. And we looked at the 12 most commonly used you know, rankings. And they're weighted differently. Yeah. They measure different things. For example, uh, there's one that's put out by four foundation funds, which is, you know, since we do well in spending on social programs, you have a high ranking. Yeah. There are others that say if you have low taxes, you have a high ranking. And so when we averaged them all up and said, let's just take an unscientific yeah. average, uh, it was pretty accurate. We're in the bottom third. Yeah. But we're closer to the middle and the bottom. Those, but those rankings, you know, don't mean a whole lot. What matters is results. And um, if we were having better results than the ones I've just discussed, no one would be looking at the 40, right. 45th uh, ranking. And, and to show you how problematic they are, the governor has to change her political ads when the rankings come out <laughs> yeah, and change. Because right. first she's 33rd in Business Insider, yeah. and then that drops to 9th. Then uh, a few months later, it's back up to 17th. Uh, you can't make economic policy based on those rankings. Those rankings are good to have. They're, they're interesting to discuss. Uh, you may look at it. I'm a, but anytime you're in a uh, in a group where your peer set is West Virginia and Mississippi, that's just not a good thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's it's a not. Of, well, that's a lot of where, where a lot of my relatives come from. Thanks a lot. But uh, no, but that's why we looked at all 12 rankings. Yeah. And you know, and I think it's it's like throwing darts at a, at a board, but at least you you've taken all the factors in, all the rankings. We you know, averaged them. And I think it's, it's kind of peasant wisdom where it came out pretty close. It showed us it's 34th, and which is the bottom third. Yeah. Okay, not so proud to be in the bottom third, uh, but it's not 48th, 49th, or 50th, because when you even, even that out. But would any of it matter if Rhode Islanders felt good about where they are? I mean, isn't that ultimately the issue is that the majority of Rhode Islanders still think we're on the wrong track? The majority of Rhode Islanders don't support Gino Raimondo. The majority of Rhode Islanders by every public poll, listen, we've been at it twice with John Delavope at Harvard. You've used another pollster. Uh, you can't find a sense that there's a lot of positive feeling about the state. Maybe it's slightly improved over previous years, but you're not seeing big momentum. That the average Rhode Islander, the person who makes sixty to hundred thousand dollars HHI, uh, is feeling good about where they are. And, and Charlie Baker said it best. He was very pragmatic. There's people looking for pragmatic people that get things done. Yeah. He said, the people that elect me governor, the people in Massachusetts, are concerned about a couple of things. They're concerned about their streets being safe. They're concerned about their kids going to a decent school so they right. get a decent job. Uh, they're concerned about their own job and state doing things to protect that job. Uh, and, and, and when people feel the government's interested in protecting their job, sending their kids to a good school, uh, keeping their daughters in safe neighborhoods, then people feel better about government. And that's what's missing here. So we have, we have, we have a, a program du jour. There was a, a great myth that said uh, the hedgehog beats the fox every time. Because the hedgehog is focused. He, you know, he burrows through and gets one or two things done. Fox is a smart aleck. He's, yeah. he, he's all over the place. Well, we have government by fox instead of government <laughs> by hedgehog. <laughs> Uh, just for the record, Charlie Baker leads the country in highest approval rating, I think, at about 76 or 78%. Yeah, he, uh, and he's not a very, uh, you know, he's not a dynamic guy. He's not an interesting guy, per se. He's a very, very straightforward guy. Not a lot of drama what, coming out of that governor's office. What people are looking for in public leadership, particularly at the state level, are pragmatic leaders. Uh, and a pragmatic leader, you know, focuses. A pragmatic leader gets the right people on the bus in the right seats, yeah. and the people off the bus. Uh, uses the bully pulpit not to spin, but to educate. Uh, and if you get, you know, leadership like that, that, that's, that talks about things that people are interested in. If you, if the next governor could convince people that what their administration would do with the uh, Board of Regents uh, and the a ride would be to make this kids' schools better. Mm -hmm. That would get their attention pretty quick. And I saw some other interesting numbers. This, this is, and this makes your point about the stagnation in the state. I think that's probably a good word to describe it. Uh, the National Assessment of Education Progress, the nation's report card, 
went back and looked at Rhode Island scores, you know, just going back uh, to 15 and then back into the 90s, we made some progress from the mid-90s to 2014. We have made zero progress on reading and math for fourth and eighth grade since that time. Our, te our, our results have maintained the same in terms of kids exceeding proficiency, in terms of uh, scores, and, and any kind of metrics that you would use uh, to measure. Now, the average guy sitting at home in Smithfield, you know, is not reading the National Assessment of Education yeah. Progress, but he's got a pretty good feel about what his kids are doing in school, and uh, he's got a pretty good feel about, you know, where things are going. And so, why I say results matter, are our schools getting better? No. Uh, <clears throat> is our employment growing? Yes, but is it growing at the national average? Uh, no. Uh, is there been good stewardship of state government? Well, if you've got food stamps or you're on Medicaid, or even more basic, just from a hardball political uh, realm, if you're in a nursing home, yeah. that's a big industry. You know, care for old people is a big, big industry. You're pretty PO'd right now, and because of systems, you know, breakdown. Uh, if, if God forbid you knew a child that went to DCYF, you're pretty concerned because kids in state care have been put in harm's way. And, and, and you, it's not one incident, but th th there's a multitude of those kinds of things where people see progress. I think our, you know, we've made progress in cleaning up unemployment uh, system tax. We made progress. Our workforce programs are much better now than they, they were a few years ago. Uh, <clears throat> make progress by articulating the need to build a better infrastructure for school facilities. That's progress, yep. and, and that shouldn't be dismissed or discounted. But you, then you have the other side of, of the figures that I mentioned, and people are not studying the numbers like we are, but they, they feel it. Uh, well, let, let's shift around a little bit. We'll leave uh, the state rankings. Let's head uh, to District 15. Always. Uh, uh, an interesting space. The one, the one in, in Cranston? Uh, the one in Cranston. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaker of the House, uh, Nick Mattiello, is, it is, uh, it is July and he's already going door to door, are the reports. He's already dro dropped some direct mail pieces. He's uh, dropped some way too, you go door to door this weather. <laughs> yeah, in this work. weather, that's right. Um, uh, his uh, GOP opponent, National uh, Republican Committee man, Steve Frias is already out there uh, in earnest going door to door. Uh, is that the best, uh, the most interesting race in Rhode Island after the governor's race? Regardless, it's, it's one of the most interesting races in Rhode Island, period, because you have an incumbent speaker who's faced a serious challenge for the second time in a row. And, you know, the, the speaker, some of his actions, appropriately so, were widely applauded by the, by the business community, he cut a lot of business taxes corporate tax, made some income tax reforms, cut the tax people pay on their pensions and stuff to a certain, right. you know, you know, level. Uh, and so it was had a, you know, a, a, a anti-tax uh, agenda to sorts, uh, yet at the same time, uh, couldn't get out of his way on the Red Sox, Poor Sox deal. Uh, he has some of his key lieutenants that just don't know how to account for campaign, <laughs> you know, money. They say, they had a lot of complexities within yeah, that particularly office. Particularly around the finance committee doing a $9 billion budget and having problems. Uh, and uh, his style, just a, yeah. a, a, a number of things. So it leads, and the, and the, and the Republicans in this case have fielded a, a very competent and qualified you know, candidate. Uh, so there's a lot going on in, in, in that district, which I think everyone thinks will be a competitive race. I think uh, a lot will depend upon who gets out the vote. Yeah, uh, he did a better job getting out the mail votes last time, but uh, I think Republicans have wised up to that. And uh, it, uh, this is going to be obviously uh, uh, a heavy turnout for an, for a non-presidential year, in all likelihood, with uh, uh, a very very competitive governor's race, um, regardless of who's in, whether it's. Ramundo or Brown, or whether it's Fung or, or Morgan, um, that's going to be a little bit of a wild card. It won't, won't have the Trump factor, uh, but it is going to have uh, a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, can Steve Frias win that race this cycle without Trump uh, and whatever the Trump bump was two yeah, years ago? Yes, uh, yes, he can, because I, as I said, he's a qualified candidate. Uh, the speaker, any speaker after six or eight years, you start to see the blemishes a lot better than you did the first yeah, two years right. you were a speaker. Uh, and the advantage he has this time is he, he, he ran with Trump 
you know, last time. So there's not that Trumpian feel to the election. Yeah. That's really a local election. And it's going to depend on who's better organized, who gets out the votes. Uh, because the speaker will be playing defense for a good deal of that election. The other, I think the other, uh, obviously uh, the speaker had a number of issues related to his staff. Frank Montanero and the Free College, uh, Catuno's son being appointed, and a series of others. Um, but also, he didn't have a very productive cycle. Uh, didn't really pass any legislation. So the argument to, you know, send me back uh, got lost uh, a little bit that he just, you know, it wasn't a big year for legislation. Well, you know, election year is not always a big year for legislation. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> they did get a budget passed. Yeah. He was able to restore uh, some of the draconian cuts that the governor recommended, particularly for the development of the disabled community who had yeah. uh, been cut you know, very significantly more than could be justified. Uh, so he, he, he was able to work to get some stuff restored in the budget. Uh, he also, in doing that, had to play a lot of an inside as opposed to an outside game trying to balance the progressive caucus versus the labor and versus the more conservative caucus uh, may mean you can accomplish things on the inside much more difficult to accomplish things on the outside. Um, speaking of progressives, uh, there seems to be a fair amount of energy between the behind progressive candidates and progressive movement in this cycle. They seem very well organized. They have some very strong candidates. Uh, they seem to be working very hard at all levels of the game now. They're proficient in social media. Um, do you see uh, an impact on uh, the uh, makeup of the assembly and just uh, in politics uh, as a whole in Rhode Island? I see potentially an impact on the assembly. Uh, and these things come gradually. There's not one wave of election. But you know you have to be impressed by some of the candidates that are running for the legislature. They're hardworking. They've raised money. They've done their homework, right. and they've been around for a while. They've been advocates. They've been activists. So I think there's a potential there. I think the only statewide race at this point where there's where it could be interesting between a progressive and a, a more traditional uh, candidate is the lieutenant governor's race. And I'm not sure how much attention people pay to look at the lieutenant uh, governor. Brown Ramondo, do you not too see early that? To, too early to tell. Um, much too early to tell. What's interesting, though, is um, you know, Brown is not exactly coming out of left field, and you, and you can't totally replicate uh, the Sanders-Hillary race. That was a Sanders-Hillary right. race that was, that, was, that was different. And a lot of the uh, left-wing progressive organizations are, have done, you know, feel they've done well with the governor and uh, support the governor, and they may not support the governor as actively as, as she would like, or I don't know that to be the case. But they're not going to be throwing rocks at her. Um, uh, uh, you're also seeing that neither of the Republican gubernatorial candidates has broken out, maybe as much as we anticipated one or both of them might have done. They seem a little stagnant. Is it too early, or is it? Uh, if you told me, if you asked me the question right now, what does Alan Fung stand for, or Patricia Morgan? I would have a better sense of Patricia Morgan, but it's not a lot of new ideas. It's, you know, truck tolls and some of the things she's discussed over the last two, four, six years. Um, is it a messaging issue? Is it well, that they're it, trying it, to keep their powder dry? What, what, what's the yeah, issue? Yeah, it's, it's very tricky because you have to win a, a Republican primary. Right. And a Republican primary in this state is nowhere representative of what the state electorate looks like. I think as I look at their campaigns, there are some fundamental differences they're drawing with the governor. The primary fundamental difference uh, is the governor thinks that corporate welfare is, is, is the crown jewel of an economic development policy. And, and whether they've articulated as well as they can or not, they're saying, no, there's a better way by, by restructuring, by, by tax cuts, uh, by, in, by improving the quality of government services. So if they can frame that message and give people a choice, then it could be an interesting election. Uh, it's difficult because the primaries are so late, you only have about six weeks after the primary to do that. Uh, but you will see. One thing that was interesting is the Republican Governor Association, I guess, uh, through whatever mechanism, had a, had a pack in here. And 
they had ads on television for a while, which didn't pass mm -hmm. what wasn't done, which leads one to believe that the people on the Republican side, you know, think that it's worth investing in the state. Yeah, that's the, that, that is the word, that this is a highly competitive uh, gubernatorial vote, and I think all the po polling shows that it is. You know, you've got a governor, regardless of whatever war chest is, stuck somewhere south of 40 um, for, for her base, and that's, you know, fairly unheard of for an incumbent uh, gubernatorial, Democratic gubernatorial candidate. Well, she's uh, more popular with some of her contributors on the West Coast and the East Coast than she is with some of the people you know, in the constituency. But that's what we talked about earlier. Absolutely. That, that was part of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the symbol. But yeah, well, I think it's also further complicated by the third person in the race. Don't know how well, how sustainable a third person you know, will be. Uh, but you know, it's worth, worth watching. Has anyone uh, uh, filed for uh, an investigation into, you, you're referring to Joe Trillo, who was the victim of uh, uh, the violent behavior of rocks jumping out in front of him in Narragansett Bay. I don't know if the state police well, you know, or the, you know, the summer, Homeland Security well, this is, is this, investigating this, this yet. This is too easy, but you know what the summer drink in Rhode Island is this year? No. Trillo won the rocks. He's Trillo won the rocks. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, uh, can he, you know, uh, can he sustain anything? Can he be competitive, or is he uh, high single digits, low teens? Can he become? Uh, can he become a viable candidate to win the, well, the governor's uh, race? See, I don't know what you mean by viable candidate. You know, can he get double digits? Yeah, he, yeah. Healy got twenty percent, but Healy had a message and done it a few yeah. times, but. When you have, you know, th three viable candidates, uh, yeah, and one's pulling anywhere from nine to thirteen, fourteen percent, then that hurts the minority party. Yeah, and that's that's that that is, could be a game changer. You know, also we have a moderate party candidate who has I don't think they have much money, but he's saying interesting things. Yeah, um, and I don't know how that'll play in the campaign. Yeah, got to see if they get signatures. Today's deadline uh, just closed. I think either at four or four thirty. Uh, it's for almost 4.30 now. Uh, I, I, we are hearing rumors, we won't, won't say what the rumors are, but some candidates may not make it to the, to the next level, uh, both uh, statewide level and, and some locally. Um, and uh, that'll make things a little more interesting uh, to clean out the field a little bit. Uh, do you see uh, right now, any issues emerging that could really recast where we are right now? The answer is, I don't know, because I didn't see the uh, pay-for-play thing getting a poster child yeah. for it. You know, that could affect the campaign. Uh, I didn't see the uh, vice chairman of the finance committee having trouble uh, distinguishing, uh, you know, accounts. For, right. you know, so, so the answer is yes. Yeah, every every week there's a there's a surprise. Something something could happen, but I don't know what it would be. Um, let's just jump to Washington for our last couple of minutes. Uh, gross dom uh, domestic product growth is up up over three percent. Mm -hmm. I can remember not long ago there was the argument that we would never be in that kind of range ever again. We would be sub two percent uh, for forevermore. It's the way the economy worked in the United States. Um, is this sustainable? Three percent GDP, and uh, and uh, horrifying to think we've got to give President Trump some credit for it. Well, I don't know if you have to give. I, I try not to give President Trump credit for very much. Uh, and President Trump can take it away from us. Yeah. So to to the extent we were able to pass the tax cut. You know, which I get a kick out of the the uh, Democrats here are still bitching about it, but that money was needed to bring the budget, state budget into balance, so that, that's that was fine. Uh, it depends on what happens and how this trade issue is played out, yeah, and so you know, Trump with the tax cut, you know, with his regulatory regime of cutting back on regulation, uh, cutting taxes. You know, giving business uh, you know more opportunity to breathe and, and, and to invest, that clearly is helpful, um, and you know it's helpful on top of the two percent growth that we had during the Obama administration. So you're not building on zero, but you are building on, on two percent. Sure. The cycle changes, inflation's coming back. That's both good and bad. But inflation is about two point nine percent last time I looked at those numbers. So that's all helpful. But how the president manages is really of a concern. So the trade wars. 
there's a difference in fighting China on intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows we've been getting snookered by China for a long time, had done anything. Uh, to fighting with EU partners and to telling a place, I, I don't know if somebody told me this at a cocktail party tonight, that... <coughs> it was one of those fancy Republican cocktail was parties it? that you socialize in. It was, was it, it Dunes Club? It was upscale. Was it upscale? upscale. But <coughs> this is the story, you know, the concern was, you know, who, where would Putin's next target be? And the guy said, well, it could be a small country uh, like Estonia or Latvia, or, you know, one of the Baltic countries. And Trump said, I'd only help them if they were paying their fair share. <laughs> well, Estonia is paying its fair share and Latvia is not. Well, we, we don't have foreign policy and we don't have trade. You know, that's just what well, you're paying you know, your fair share. So what happens, you know, with agricultural products, what happens with certain kind of manufacturing, you know, can be affected. There's some numbers that we look at that indicate that at least 25 to 33 percent of the benefit of the tax cut will be lost as a result of the trade policies that, that are being spoken about right now. The short answer to your question is we can maintain 3%. We should be able to maintain 3%, but we've got to stay the course on, on government spending, on education, and on regulation. Uh, and then, we, then, then, this, then there's no reason why we can't. But you throw in this tariff mess, you throw in this unpredictable foreign policy, the market gets spooked awful easily. Does Trump's... Um uh, and this past week, obviously, was a week of uh, confusing foreign policy, should I say? Is that the nicest way to put it? Uh, does this uh, lack of stability in the White House, uh, staffing changes, incoherent foreign policy, um, you know, strange behaviors, does this ultimately benefit Gina Raimondo in, run, in winning re-election? Or does the average voter, when they walk into the voters' booth, really separate Alan Fung and Gina Raimondo well, so, from? I, I would argue um, it may be the opposite in this state because it could adversely affect Trillo, mm -hmm. who's the poster child yeah. for, 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 tr for, for, for Trump. Tr for Trump. Uh, now, it, it also depends how Gina spends the $4 million because they're trying to paint you know, Fung as a Trump Republican. And yeah, if they're successful in doing it, it could have an impact. But it's not clear that they're going to be successful in, in, in doing that. Well, listen, as always, a wealth of knowledge. See how I worked wealth into that? Just a wealth of knowledge, the money man, Gary Sass. No. Uh, any, uh, in, you get any stock picks for us before you leave off? Uh, gold bullion, a good investment? No, just like the state. Bitcoins. No, just like the state treasury, indexed funds. <laughs> indexed funds. Exchange traded funds <laughs> <laughs> that, that are indexed. Bonds. Do you like bonds these days? Well, you know, being uh, you know conservative, always have forty percent, thirty-five, forty percent in bonds. So not well, you need that tax-free uh, coverage from all the wealth. The American has uh, tax-free funds. Yeah. That's around, yeah. Uh, Gary Sass, as always, just a great, uh, a great way to end uh, Monday on uh, on Business Monday here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Thank our friends over at Deepwater Wind. Uh, tomorrow we will be back. It will be a bang-up lineup. Uh, Rachel Noons leads it off at the 3 o'clock hour. Uh, until then, we will, uh, we'll see you and uh, tune in and check out on social media all the things that are developing uh, overnight here at Go Local. Uh, thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.